Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, yep, it's Wednesday, so we're gonna have another midweek mini mail call. No change, it's gonna be a normal mail call, so I think without further ado, let's get right to it. I have a package from Amazon here, and it's definitely from a viewer because it says mail call on it. Looks like we have a note inside. Aha, a gift for you. Hi, Adrian, I've seen you use standard probes to beep out traces. The pointed probes make things a lot easier. They poke through corrosion, oxidation, and also solder mask. Enjoy, Hans. All right, awesome. So who makes these, I wonder? So the probes I, oh, these are the really sharp ones. Okay, so the ones I typically use are my EEV blog multimeter, and they're pretty sharp. Like, you could poke yourself and cause some damage. But these ones, on the other hand, these are like surgical needles. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. I have to be careful putting the cap back on. I don't stick myself with these. And we have these. What are, these have caps. Oh, wow. Oh, these are really sharp as well. Easier to put the caps back on those. So surgical needle style, also very sharp. And then we have a set of leads. Oh, these are pretty nice. They're, they're relatively flexible. I wonder if these are silicone, but either way, um, they're pretty nice. So you plug these into your multimeter, these angled ends, and then this is what you plug your probes into. Fortunately, these got squished in shipping. Okay, there we go. And then in this bag here, it's a set of hooks, which are very handy. Very cool, Hans, thank you very much. So let's take a look at this stuff on the bench. These are those incredibly sharp probes from Hans. Let's get this out of here. In case anyone wants to order this yourself, there is the Amazon description, so you can check it out, see if you can find one in stock or whatever. Let me grab my AN8008. This multimeter is a very inexpensive one and actually kind of recommend it. I, I think I read about it on the EEV blog forums first. It comes with really junky probes like that are so dull that it, you try to measure something and you're like, ah, I'm not reading anything. And that's because the probes are so bad. So I'm gonna try these probes on this thing. Luckily it uses standard connectors here, so these will go in. Oh yeah, but they're squished. I think once it's in the multimeter for a little while, it will be fine because it's sort of soft and pliable, but both of these are sort of squished. But with a little forming, there we go, they, it goes in. And with it in the multimeter, these are the other ends. Uh, these are also squished a little bit, you see, <laughs> see that? That's not, not wonderful. Okay, so you take one of the ends like this, and I have to unsquish this, and that slides in like so. We take this one, unsquish it as well, slide it in. So these two probes have caps on them, so I can pop these caps off. And you can just see how sharp, look at that, look at that, super sharp. Excellent for making sure you make good contact with something, cut through the oxidation, whatnot. So, and these also have banana jacks on them, which actually allows you to plug it into something else. Like, I mean, I don't want to push too hard because it might poke through, but it was it'd be compatible with going into banana jack female connector. So you could chain this together with something else. And with the cap on, the tip just sticks through, just. Not quite sure. Oh yeah, okay, so it sticks through enough. If we turn this on, let's switch this to continuity. Ugh, I always forget how to use this. I never really use this. It's sort of my secondary multimeter. All right, there we go. It doesn't retain the last setting. So you can just make contact. And if we take this screwdriver here, I think the way these tips are, I can, if you push down hard enough, it actually bends the little rubber piece here and makes contact with the screwdriver. Okay, so that's these tips, these very, very, very sharp ones. Let's pull these out. 
And then there's these tips. We, these are like syringes. Where's the other one? Over here. These are like needle points. You could easily skewer yourself. If you, if you jab too hard, that would go right in like a needle. <laughs> So I like these, especially because they're very long. So it would allow you to really get into a tight spot between something and, and probe. So that's cool. But I think I actually prefer these ones. They're just more sturdy, but clearly wouldn't be able to get them into as tight of a spot. And now the other issue is if I lose these little caps, which I might've done, no, here it is. If I lose these, you can stick yourself, like you'll to reach into go get these and you're like, ah, and you have a probe sticking out of your hand. That's not ideal. So I thought for a second these go together, but I think that's not the case. I think these clips actually go on here. Yes, they do. No, they don't. They're, hmm. Okay, yeah, that's right, they do. It's a little fiddly to get the rubber boot over, but that's a good solid connection now. It's not going anywhere. So yeah, you can take these Take that off and it's the banana connector part that it's connecting into. You put that in there. And the only thing you have to do is make sure you hold the actual metal. And um, well, the boot doesn't slide over super well. It's actually getting hung up right there. That's what's wrong. There we go. And there's one more thing. Let's take these off. And this is what we have here. So these are like big, easy hooks which are pretty useful. I really like these. If you don't have a set of multimeter probes with these types of hooks on it, I really recommend it. Okay, so I thought that this plugs into this, but that's actually not the case. These just connect directly into the multimeter, like this. So well, there we go. So I'm not quite sure I understand that. So like these would go in the multimeter and then why wouldn't these clips plug into here? so that you actually get a little bit more length. This is not super long here. You can buy these clips pretty inexpensively and I've actually, I have a whole bunch of them in a drawer somewhere, a little, one of my organizer drawers here. I've cut some multimeter probes where the, the tips were really bad on them and I have connected these types of hooks because the hooks are so useful. So I think I'm just going to keep these on here because I need to get that squished rubber on here, flattened back out or made circular again. So I'm gonna keep these like this, keep them in my drawer with the multi other multimeters and the test equi equipment. And then these, um, well, I'll keep them in there too because there's gonna be an opportunity where those are gonna be very useful. And then these things um, I'll keep handy as well because you can never have enough hooks for things. So thank you very much, Hans, for sending in this stuff here. I, I do appreciate it. And um, I'm sure we'll be seeing these very sharp probes on a video soon. I have a package here from Kevin in Fairfield, Ohio. Hi to all my Ohio viewers. I think Kevin used gaffer tape to close this box because it's really strong. The cardboard is ripping before the tape. All right, so there's a letter and it reads, Dear Adrian, included are two one megabyte, I think, SIP RAM modules for the Hummingboard card that we talked about. And that's right, we chatted via email about this. When I pulled them out of an old 386SX, they worked fine, so hopefully one day you'll find more information on that card and you can put it to good use again. I've also included a few bags of German Haribo candy from a local international market. Hopefully they are some new flavors for you. All right, well, that's pretty cool here. We have some uh, of the berries. Now, I've only had the US version of these. I didn't even know that they sold them in Germany. Now, interesting is I have over here a big box of candy, stuff that people have sent in on mail call, and lots of it's from Germany and other international countries. I have not seen the berries. Now, the thing about the berries, the US ones, is I like them. Wow, are they sugary. They're so sweet. So I can only eat a couple at a time. Maybe the German ones will be less sweet and maybe they'll, they'll taste a little more realistic. And we have another one here, Confect. Okay, haven't tried those before. And then we also have some German Happy Cherries. All right, cool. I think these are all new flavors. What's this? This is just plastic. Let me unwrap this. So regarding the candy, is I'm not gonna be doing taste tests generally on the main channel here, unless it's just like one small thing. 
but I intend to do candy reviews on the second channel, but I just haven't figured out how yet. I, should I just make an entire video about candy reviews? Because there's a lot of different stuff over there. But people might be really bored with that. So maybe what I'll do is before I make a second channel video, I'll just grab one of the random things, uh, say who it's from, just quickly do a taste test, a little mini review, and then get to the the main bulk of the video. I, I don't know, I don't know. If you have any ideas, comment in the comment section below, please. All right, so here's a little package. It says, open this side up, memory. It looks like he 3D printed something just to keep this memory safe, which is pretty amazing, Kevin. Thank you very much for that. And sure enough, once I got this gaffer tape off the bottom, he 3D printed a little case to hold the memory. So there are the sips. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at that on the bench and I'll break out the hummingboard as well. All right, these are the sips that Kevin sent along. And yeah, check out this 3D printed holder that he made so that they wouldn't get damaged because of course those pins are very bendy. <laughs> really smart there, Kevin. In fact, is this something like for just regular Sims? Did you design this? And if you did, if, is it uploaded to Thingiverse? In case anyone else wants to save their sips from bent pins. Here is that humming board. This is the thing with all the memory on it. Just look at all that sip memory there, except for the one missing module that we saw in the last mail call when I talked about this thing. Unfortunately, Lots of people sent articles and information about this thing to me, about the pricing and whatnot, but no one had the software to try to get this thing actually working. So if someone's watching this and maybe they didn't see the first mail call for some round, perhaps you know of this board, the Hummingboard RN11 by AI Architects, 1986, for artificial intelligence, programming, processing, an entire coprocessor board for your PC, it has a 386 and a math coprocessor on it and all this RAM. Let me just insert one of these one megabyte 80 nanosecond modules into here. It's very fiddly with the pins, but as we discussed in the video about this thing, the benefit is the density. You can get this really high density going on here. Imagine in 1986 having something that has 24 megs of RAM on it. This doesn't have 24 megs because these smaller memory modules here are 256 each. So this has 12 megabytes of RAM on it right now. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep this extra memory module in here in the bag with this thing so that if I ever do get to power this thing up and one of these modules is bad, then I'll have an extra one meg module at least to try this thing out with. So thanks very much, Kevin, for sending in these sips for maybe the day when the hummingboard lives again. We have a package here, it comes from Theodore in Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi to all my Nebraska viewers. Uh, he writes, open other side for note. All right, I can oblige that. And indeed, we have a little note here. Theodore, or Ted, says, here's that working C64 Mini I said I would send. I almost included the joystick that came with two, but in your recent NES64 controller video, you led right off the bat saying you don't like the style. <laughs> you're right, you're right. I'm glad you kept it because honestly, yeah, like that does really hurt my hands. I don't think I ever updated the firmware on the Mini, so make sure you do that to get all the latest features and games. I also included a big Commodore logo sticker that I thought you might enjoy. And there it is, a 64 Mini. Previous viewer had sent one of these in to me from Germany, but that one seemed to have had some SDRAM failure on it, so it doesn't work anymore. And it's a pretty cool little thing. I like the form factor of this. Unlike what seems like every other YouTube channel, I haven't actually played with a working one of these yet, so it'll be kind of neat. And then, yep, there it is, the Chicken Lips Commodore logo. Very nice. It's really nicely printed as well. Maybe I'll need to stick it on something like on this TV right here on the side. I figure this TV will live with me until it dies, so might as well put stickers on it, right? All right, so let's take a look at this on the bench, see if it still works. A C64 Mini and an awesome sticker from Ted. So I don't know if I really need to show too much about this, but I'm definitely gonna plug this in and make sure it works because it didn't have so much luck with the last one. I'm going to try to use this iBuffalo classic USB controller. I love this thing, it's got a great D-pad, Pretty much in the same class as far as goodness goes as the original Super NES controller. At least I think so. 
And this one's not very worn out, so it actually feels pretty good. I have no idea how compatible this is with stuff like this. Can you access all the functions, like get to the menu and stuff with these extra buttons on here? Can you remap them? And let's plug in a little power bank for power into this. Power light comes on, which is a good sign because it didn't on the original one I had because that is controlled by the firmware. Ah, look at that, it's working. Okay, so right off the bat, I can move left and right with the controller. Let's see if I can start impossible mission. Uh, start button? No. Okay, it was one of these top buttons here that seemed to do it. All right, well, pushing the start button. Don't really like how if I hold it down, it kind of comes up and goes away so quickly. So I can bring up this menu. Oh, it's a little hard to control just because it auto repeats so quickly. I'm back in the main menu, checking out the firmware, and it is a build from 2018. So definitely need to update this thing as Ted had recommended. Let me quickly do that right now. Okay, let's see, I'll turn this thing off, shutting down, and I'm gonna plug in this thumb drive that has firmware copied onto it. It's weird how the ports are upside down. I think it's the way that this thing is made, so it's just weird when you plug in the thumb drive, you gotta make sure you flip it over. Okay, I pushed the power button. Okay, it came up. I don't think it does anything, and that's understandable. System info, do you wish to update the firmware to 1.5.2? Apply. As is obvious, this thing does not have a working keyboard, at least not the stock one. There's been some projects out there on YouTube to put a keyboard in here. So I'm gonna use this Apple iMac keyboard here. And the good thing about it is it has a USB hub on it. So actually what I'll do is I'll leave the controller plugged into the unit. I'll plug the thumb drive into the keyboard and that's because I have a couple things copied on here to try out. And then we'll plug the keyboard into the mini. That should do the trick. A little bit of a rat's nest of wires. Oops, I just launched a game. I'm not familiar with this game here. It appears that the sound is not working and I don't think that's anything wrong. That is just because it comes out of HDMI and I have it going into the capture device and I'm not seeing it capturing the audio. So I actually have never tested the capture of audio. So that may be completely normal and not an actual flaw. Oh good, they fixed the auto repeat, so to speak, when you push the controller down, it now moves as I would expect it to. Let's go see what we see in here. Computer model, PAL or NTSC, awesome. Seems that the start button is the equivalent of the back button on the actual joystick for this thing. Boot mode into the carousel or to the classic. USB keyboard, well, we're using a US one. I guess that's all there really is to say. That's all that's in here. So how do we get to classic mode? Oops. All ah, right, okay, this allows me to pick the type of emulation. I really wish there was a way to pick the color palettes because I find that the colors that this thing uses are a little bit too washed out. I think the original controller for this has four special buttons, so to speak. It seems that start and select map to the right two special buttons. Now I gotta say, just glancing at the games on here, the update has included a bunch of new stuff. Here is Galancia, which is a fantastic game from 2017. Barnsley Badger's on here. There's now modern games, Soulless. I, I didn't actually see if these were on here before, so I do apologize if they were, but kind of cool to see that some of these are on here. Okay, I've been fiddling around trying to figure out how to get to just the standard C64 basic screen. Maybe it's this classic mode. Uh, oh yeah, right, okay, there it is. This is a Commodore 64. Hmm, I don't love the scaling. The thickness of the T and the H and the I don't match. I assume if I put a bunch of H's, okay, those do match. I don't know, that just doesn't feel right. It's like it's using some kind of nearest neighbor filtering versus a soft filtering. And must be the resolution this thing is running in or maybe the font is just not an exact copy. You can really see it on the Y. The lower part of the Y is thinner than the upper part, but on a real 64, it's the same on the both parts. So that's, that's a little strange. 
Okay, to get back to the menu, I assume I can push start. Yep, there it is. And let's go to options. And we can exit to carousel mode. Okay, yeah, this definitely works. And then down here I have a little thumb drive icon and I copied some stuff onto here. So I have my Easy Flash 3 tool set. I have no idea if it can load this. Let's just see what happens if I try. This is basically a CRT file. Hey, it actually loaded. Check that out. All right, well, here we go, 8-Bit Dance Party. I think it's gonna be a sad one because we have no sound, but there it is, it's totally running. But no sound, therefore, no dance party. <laughs> but the fact that it can launch Easy Flash 3 images directly, I don't think I was aware that it could do that. Very helpful for me just because I have a bunch of my stuff in Easy Flash 3 images already, and that's just kind of cool and a shortcut to launching those. Cool, this works. Let's try the 80 columns <laughs> thing for the 64. Uh, yeah, there you go. We're running in 80 columns. This, oh uh, yeah, you can really see the scaling there on the H. Notice how it's not the same thickness every time on a real 64 that is. Is there a way to improve the scaling on this thing? Maybe, maybe there's something in the settings. How about under the little monitor thing here? So I picked North American. What if I pick CRT? I don't like the fake scan lines. I suppose Pixel Perfect would probably do it. So we'll try that. Of course, outputting to an HDMI monitor, this looks a little funky now, but I think if we launch the 80 column mode, this should look right now. Yep, no problems now. So this is 80 columns on a C64. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm assuming the compatibility is great. We can load C64 robots here. This is David Murray's Attack of the Petsky Robots. Too bad we don't have sound because there would be some sound here. Start game. And there's the game running. Looks really sharp and clear as it should because of course it's on uh, HDMI. <laughs> so awesome, Ted, thank you very much for sending me a working 64 Mini and this big Commodore sticker. I really appreciate it. And with that, we're gonna end this video here. Once again, I'd like to thank my viewers who've sent stuff in a mail call, especially the ones for this video, but also all the other items that have been sent in. I have quite a lot of backlog around the basement here. I'm sort of looking behind the camera of stuff I haven't shown yet. So don't worry if you've sent something in, it will be coming up soon. I'd like to give a shout out and a big thank you to all my patrons. You'll be seeing their names scrolling up the side of the screen right now. And if you'd like to see your name scrolling up the side of the list here as well, you can click the Patreon link in the description below and become a supporter of the channel. There's a couple perks with that, including early access to videos and better access to message me because I prioritize communication with my patrons over the regular channel email account. If you like this video, appreciate a thumbs up and comments in the comment section below and subscribe to the channel, that really helps. And don't forget to check out my second channel, Adrian's Digital Basement 2, like Apple 2, not the number two. I put videos up there about twice a week. It's a little bit different than what's on the main channel, but it's very similar. So if you like my stuff, it's just more of it. So I think that is gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.